Welcome, my name is Robin Gross, and I'm with IP Justice in San Francisco, the chair of ICANN's non-commercial stakeholder group. Uh, this morning's panel is on uh, human rights, and in particular, how the multi-stakeholder model is able to handle or isn't able to handle human rights concerns in its policy development processes. Uh, so. I was at the very first um, uh, IGF, the first two, and um, I, what was really shocked me about this year's IGF is all the discussion about human rights, because we really weren't allowed or supposed to be talking about that in the first two IGFs that I attended. And so for me to come back six years later and see so many people saying we need to address human rights, we need to address human rights in the internet governance uh, system has been very encouraging and frankly fascinating just this, this change that, that we've seen in the last few years. So let me uh, first introduce our panelists. And then we can just go go right into our discussion. Um, immediately here to to my uh, left is Peter Dengate Thrush, who was the uh, previous chairman of the board of ICANN, and uh, uh, can help explain a little bit about ICANN's structure and, and background. And then uh, to his left is Sarah Falvey from Google, and she can give us some information on the business sector, private sector perspective on handling uh, human rights in multi-stakeholderism and. Down at the end of the panel there, we've got Nicholas Seidler with ISOC, and that's the Internet Society. And we've got three uh, uh, remote participant panelists on the line as well. We've got uh, Dr. Milton Mueller, who's with Syracuse University, and we've got, uh, and also the Internet Governance Project. And also Dr. Simon Rice, who's with Article 29 Data Protection Authority, and also the UK uh, Data Protection Authority. And then we've also got uh, Stephanie Perrin. She is a, a Canadian privacy expert and also is currently participating in ICANN's uh, expert working group on directory services, which has been set up to address some of the, the privacy concerns at ICANN. So we've got ICANN sort of as the, uh, the, the overall or the example child, if you will, for, for multi-stakeholderism and, and how, how has multi-stakeholderism been uh, working out with respect to human rights. So let me quickly turn it over to, to Peter who can help explain how ICANN's uh, structure is uh, set up to deal with human rights. Peter? Thanks, Robin, and good morning, everybody. Uh, so I thought it might be helpful. There's always a lot of talk at, uh, at IGFs about ICANN, uh, and I thought it might be helpful just to, to realize that not everyone's been to ICANN meetings, and it might be helpful to explain a little bit, first of all, about what ICANN is and how it's structured. And then uh, I'm going to take a couple of the key activities and some of the core constitutional documents and explain how they fit, uh, and then hand over to people much more qualified than, than I to actually uh, discuss the human rights implications of those structures and some of those documents. So uh, a quick overview of the origin and nature of ICANN. Why is there an ICANN and how did it come to be? And then um, part of that is the is one of the founding documents of ICANN is this thing called the White Paper, uh, which discussed the formation of a body that would take care of these particular functions. Uh, and then ICANN became that body. A quick look at the ICANN bylaws, looking for uh, what the rules are uh, about human rights, if any. And then um, of the many documents that I thought we could look at, and I was originally planning to take you through the, uh, the two key business documents, the registry contract for the new GTLDs and the registrar contracts, all of which are very fiercely contested documents because they're discussed in the ICANN multi-stakeholder process. Um, but in the interest of time, I've left those wonderful contracts off and we'll just stick with the bylaws and the affirmation of commitments. And I hear sighs of relief from uh, the... Otherwise, we'll be here all day. So let's have a quick look at the origins. <coughs> and I've started, uh, although the long... Uh, we could start earlier. 1996 seems to be an appropriate time because at that stage, the Internet Society, ISOC, excuse me, <coughs> was under pressure to form some kind of international Internet governance structure, particularly coming under pressure around domain names. So they formed a thing called the International Ad Hoc Coalition and said, uh, come back and tell us how we should manage this domain name um, the DNS thing that we do. 
So I came back in early 1997 and made those findings about domain names are a public resource, there should be wholesale retail, because prior to that there wasn't, there was just a single body, you'd go to the registry who also acted as the registrar, so they said there should be a, a, a tier of competitive registrars, there should be trademark protection, the World Intellectual Property Organisation, the WIPO, should have a role in helping resolve trademark disputes, and by the way there should be some new GTLDs introduced and they said let's have seven. <coughs> and the structure they proposed for setting this up caused a bit of uh, outcry in the United States, which has always had a historically uh, dominant role in terms of funding the technical developments of the internet and also the administration such as it ex existed. So realising that the community was getting on and doing something, the government uh, said, well, they produced a, a green paper, a thought piece, that said um, these are the kind of principles that we think should be uh, uh, should apply to internet governance, um, and it contained these key principles, that the processes by which internet governance should run should be bottom up, there should not be a command and control structure from the top down, but the people concerned with the issue should be making the policies and feeding them up through some administrative structure, that largely we were looking at the industry to regulate itself, we weren't looking at uh, some other set of regulations to be imposed. The rules and the process should be transparent. Somebody coming along should be able to see what had happened, see who had been involved, see when and where a particular process had been made, uh, and it should be GI diverse. In other words, the people from all over the world should be equally represented in this process and should have equal access. It should be largely government free. Now this is an interesting thing that probably would not have happened had it not happened in the United States uh, with a history uh, slightly different, particularly in telco. Uh, and telecommunications regulations from other countries. But it wasn't that governments were not to be involved, but they were to be uh, restricted and, and only involved in certain areas and only to a limited extent. As we've seen, there should be a role for the World Intellectual Property Organization in resolving trademark disputes, and where possible, competition should be a principle used for resolving issues. So as a result of that, the group, the Internet Committee, put together a set of bylaws that have built uh, an organisation called ICANN, which originally looked like that, and I'm going to build it quite quickly. So on the left hand side, um, a body called the DNSO, the Domain Name Support Organisation. So a support organisation at ICANN, and SO is like a corporate division. And this is the corporate division that deals with domain names, and there was going to be a council running it, and the different components came from the ISPs, the trademark lawyers, business, non-commercial, registries, registrars, and the country code managers. Then there were supposed to be uh, uh, the bodies that manage protocols, the ITU was there, the IETF, uh, Etsy and the World Wide Web Consortium. Uh, the numbers at the top are the number of board seats each of these SOs got, and then there were the address organisation. And at the start there were only three. There was the European address organisation, RIPE, the North American one, ARIN, and the Asia Pacific APNIC. At that stage there wasn't a separate Latin American Caribbean address organisation and there wasn't a, uh, an African one. And then there were four other seats that were just appointed uh, from the board and there were five board seats that came from the community at large. And there was an at-large election, 176,000 uh, people voted online and elected people to that. And then there was a government, the role for governments, which I mentioned. There was a special governmental advisory committee, you hear people talk about the GAC. And uh, the original membership included some of the people who'd been involved in the early days, including that international ad hoc coalition. So what does it look like now? Well, it's uh, very much the same. Um, there's a, a board which is the major authority-making, rule-making body, and it receives input from, on the left-hand side, you'll see the president and CEO and the staff of the administration. Then you'll see there's still three support organisations, still three corporate divisions, the address the GNSO for generic names and the country code names uh, through the, and you can see who makes those up, there's now the five address registries, inside the GNSO is all the registries and registrars, uh, business, non-commercial, etc, and then there are the country codes. And supporting that are these standing committees, one from the root server advisory, one from the security and stability community, one from the at large, which is all the user community. Uh, the specialist technical liaison group from a group of technical uh, institutions which replaced the, it's where the IETF and the, I, and the World Wide Web Consortium sit, and the Internet Engineering Task Force, and still giving advice at the top of the tree, straight to the board, uh, is the Governmental Advisory Committee. So that's the organisational structure. 
And I don't propose to read you the bylaws, but looking at, uh, at the mission, this has been largely unchanged, uh, well, has been unchanged since 1998. This is what ICANN does. Its mission is to coordinate these three different things, the domain names, IP protocol addresses and AS numbers, and the protocol and port parameters. So you'll often hear people talk about mission creep, and what they're talking about is ICANN moving away from doing any of these jobs. So as soon as ICANN, people ask ICANN to, and they have in the past asked ICANN to intervene in trademark disputes or copyright disputes and all sorts of other things, the answer is no. Here is the mission of ICANN, coordinating, uh, not managing or governing, but coordinating because other bodies are involved in this. The people who actually issue domain names, for example, are the CCTLD registries. So they, the ICANN role is to coordinate the allocation of domain names and uh, coordinate also the operation of the DNS root system, and then almost as an adjunct, coordinate policy development reasonably and appropriately related to these technical functions. So it's not appropriate for ICANN to be straying from these, uh, these goals. And then the values that ICANN is supposed to use in doing that, and you might start looking now for some of the human rights issues. The, pri the first one that ICANN is charged with doing is preserving the stability and security and reliability of the net itself. And doing that it has to respect creativity and innovation, it's got to delegate, coordinate to the appropriate bodies rather than try and do everything itself. It's got to get broad participation from around the community and where possible use market mechanisms to sustain a competitive environment. Again, moving reasonably quickly through these, promote competition in relation to domain names, employ open and transparent policy development mechanisms, make decisions by applying policies neutrally and objectively with integrity and fairness. So you might be able to start to sheet back some human rights issues to these, these values. Speed that's responsive, remain accountable with the community, and while rooted in the private sector, recognise that governments and public authorities also have a role. And then there's this that says, look, in applying these core values, you've got to do your best. You may not always be able to apply all of them simultaneously, but you must make sure you do your best uh, to determine which of those core values are the most relevant and come to an appropriate and defensible balance among competing values. Again, from the bylaws, looking for things that actually relate to human rights. Uh, one of them is this obligation to operate openly and transparently and to deliver fairness and not, in doing any of these things, be inequitable or single out any particular party for disparate treatment. So it might be that would include singling out a particular race or creed or class or gender for uh, inappropriate treatment. <clears throat> Again, accountability. How do you check that ICANN is doing these things? Well, it's got to be accountable to the community for operating in a manner that's consistent with those bylaws. So there should be periodic reconsideration, uh, processes for independent review to make sure that ICANN is actually kept to the mark. So let's come to, so that, that's really all that's in the bylaws that talk about uh, how ICANN is to do its job, what are the values that it's supposed to bring to that, but those particular tasks, those three coordination roles. So in Looking at what it's actually done, uh, we start off by a signing a memorandum of understanding between ICANN and the United States government. Remember the very important role the United States had. And under this memorandum uh, is this concept of trans transitioning the control of the DNS to private sector management, to ICANN. But before it would do that, the US Department of Commerce, that's what the DOC stands for, required assurances really that ICANN was up to the job that it had the capacity and resources to assume these responsibilities. So the memorandum said, well, let's get together and design this DNS project. Design, develop, and test the mechanisms, methods, and procedures that should be in place. So what this became uh, was a mechanism for building ICANN and for the Department of Commerce to check on what ICANN was doing and to make sure that it was uh, achieving the goals. And so to do that, it had to establish policy for the allocation of IP addresses, look after the root server, do these various jobs. Uh, take over the .com, .net, and uh, .org registry agreements that previously had been between the Department of Commerce and VeriSign, or NSI as it was in those days. So under this agreement, ICANN took over the management of these important contracts. Now, although this agreement was only supposed to last for two years, and the domain name system and management of it was supposed to be shifted to ICANN quite quickly, 
it actually had, took a lot longer to build a global multi-stakeholder organisation and win the trust of the international internet community. Uh, and so the memorandum of understanding was rolled over uh, for several times until it was changed in 2006 to a thing that was the joint, called the Joint Project Agreement. And the key feature of this was this regular reporting to the Department of Commerce on how ICANN was doing and regular oversight by the Department of Commerce on ICANN as it developed. But in 2009 ICANN said no more, we're not going to continue signing this, we do not long wish to maintain this relationship with the US Department of Commerce. And so we changed the relationship from a, a subservient reporting under this relatively heavy agreement to a different agreement which said under that ICANN just declared to the world how, how it was going to, what it was going to do and how it was going to do it. And the reaction worldwide to this was very good. I just picked out the comment from uh, Vivian Reading, the EU, which talked about ICANN no longer being subject to the unilateral review by the US Department of Commerce but by independent review panels. So the, the, the supervision, the supervisory mechanism for ICANN shifted from the US Department of Commerce to a series of community panels put together by the internet community itself to look and report on how ICANN was doing. Was it operating transparently? Is it operating fairly? Is it discriminating against anybody? So the shift to this kind of uh, governance uh, met with reasonably good approval. So what does it say? What's in the affirmation of commitments? Well, it says, First of all, the decisions will be made in the public interest. Again, if, if, if you can declare that human rights are in the public interest, you could bring your human rights uh, issues in under this requirement. ICANN has to operate in the public interest and has to be accountable and transparent. It still obviously has to preserve the security, stability and resilience of the DNS. It's still got to promote competition, consumer trust and consumer choice. And it's got to maintain that geodiversity, international participation. More from the affirmation, the Department of Commerce says that uh, it will do these things as well. It says that a private body is best able to flexibly meet the changing needs of the internet. And it also recognises that inside ICANN there's a group of participants that engage regularly, so there is a bunch of insiders, and to ensure that the decisions are in the public interest and not just in the interests of the, of the particular in crowd, ICANN says it will perform and publish analyses of its decisions, including financial impact uh, and on the, uh, on the stability of the DNS. So ICANN does this by setting up these reviews, continually assessing uh, the Board of Directors performance, assessing the role and effectiveness of the Government Advisory Committee, continually assessing and improving its processes, assessing to the extent to which the decisions are supported by the community, and looking at the policy development process, how are these decisions being created, being made? What are the processes to make sure that the community is adequately involved? So that's uh, accountability and transparency. There's also similar reviews, and I won't go through the text of them, in relation to uh, stability and security and resilience itself. And another one in relation to consumer choice and consumer trust. And this is relevant because this says that uh, as it expands the domain name space, there will be a year after the new, first of the new GTLDs go live, there will be a complete review as the extent to which the introduction of new GTLDs has promoted competition, consumer trust and consumer choice. So, to close, ICANN began as a technical coordinating body responsible for those three key resources, names and numbers and parameters. Policy making is almost an adjunct, it's only got to make policy development reasonably and appropriately related to these technical functions. So some might argue that policies relating to human rights issues as long may not have a place. I think, with, I think I've probably shown that there are enough places where you can say the obligation to act transparently and fairly uh, is a place where you can bring in human rights obligations. Technical stability, reliability and security, however, is the prime objective. All of the documents start with that. that that's ICANN's prime directive. Make sure that there is an internet to, wor to worry about. And the key white paper principles were private sector leadership, self-regulation, bottom-up policy development, being largely government free and using competition. And in my submission, in my view, those policies ha have served ICANN really well. It's just finished its first 15 years of operation. But the application of human rights is not precluded and should result in better policy making and greater acceptance of ICANN's role. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for that really 
interesting overview of, of ICANN's structure and, and, and how human rights might fit into, uh, into the existing structure. <clears throat> uh, our next speaker is a uh, remote uh, panelist, um, Dr. Milton Mueller, and uh, he's uh, been uh, with ICANN since its beginning and, and has been a human rights advocate, and so he can give us a, a bit of a discussion on how, how that experience has been over the years. Milton. Milton, are you there? I'm here. Fabulous. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Yes, please go ahead. Thank okay. you. I've been shouting at the microphone for two minutes here, so uh, let me get started um, with this. Okay, so I uh, have problems with the term multi stakeholder. Um, I'm especially irritated by the way the Internet Society and uh, certain other interests, including the U.S., have uh, made the concept of the multi stakeholder model for valid insight for all the good things about internet governance. And I think we have to clear this up before we really understand the human rights issues. So, what we usually call TMM, or the multi stakeholder model, is more accurately called the organically developed internet institutions. And these are the IETF, the regional internet registries. And to some extent, ICANN, though, as Peter's presentation made clear, ICANN is more properly seen as the same mutant form of the organically developed internet institutions. And there is no single multi stakeholder model. Indeed, it's not even correct to call some of the key internet institutions multi stakeholders. The IETF, for example, is based entirely on individual participation, not on structured representation of multiple stakeholder groups. The IETF is open, and its decisions are based on your ability to code and to write standards documents that others support. Uh, you did not get voice and representation or influence in the IETF because you were civil society or a government or a representative of a corporation or a woman or one part of the geographic world. It's all based on individual representation. Now, what are the defining characteristics of the organically developed internet institutions? Number one, they are private sector nonprofits. Number two, they're not controlled or owned by government. Number three, they are open to participation by anyone. And number four, they make policy on a bottom up basis, more or less by consensus. But one of these institutions, I can, is very different. Like the others, it was a private corporation, and participation is open. But its policymaking process is, has structured representation of broad categories of groups, sometimes called, as you saw in previous presentation, constituency, stakeholder groups, supporting organizations. And ICANN is much more governmental than the other organizations. Uh, it has it is in control, in some sense, by the U.S. government through the Iowa contract. And it has a formal representation of government, the governmental advisory committee. Also, ICAP does not really have a bottom up process. The bottom, when you come down to it, merely advises the top, the board, and GAC advice or staff implementation can and frequently does override the bottom up policy making process. Okay, so what does all this have to do with human rights? Well, there's two things that make multi stakeholder double good for human rights, and we need to identify them. Number one, it keeps policymaking out of the hands of intergovernmental politics. There are a lot of repressive states in the world, and if laws and policies are made through international treaties, those states have the same voice as liberal democratic states to support human rights. 
Moreover, an intergovernmental environment more in control with basically security and sovereignty, not individual freedom or individual rights. When states struggle with each other, they struggle fundamentally over their own interests as a state. So that's one good thing about multi-stakeholder government that just keeps policy making pretty much out of that world. So there's a second thing that's good, and that is because it is more open, and because it's more rooted in actual internet users and suppliers, uh, multi-stakeholder systems are more are less likely to be hostile to some of the key human rights like free expression or privacy. In other words, human rights advocates can come into these institutions and participate on more or less equal terms with all the other institutions, and they can make noise. They're not getting a few of good results, but they certainly can make their feelings known. Now, on the other hand, and we need this as a multi stakeholderism especially one with a monopoly, one in which governments are active players and where the power is centralized, it can also be a very bad place to be in life. So I'll give you three reasons why I think that's the case. First, private actors can make you give up statutory rights via contract. Uh, so because private actors are not state actors, they are not bound by certain constitutional guarantees of government rights. An example would be uh, the GAC vetoes of certain top-level domain names uh, because they are, what they say, culturally sensitive, or uh, they simply don't like them. Uh, it would be illegal for a state actor such as the U.S. government to suppress the use of a name simply because it was culturally sensitive. Uh, it would really have to be strictly illegal, either some kind of an obscenity or a legal under some specific law regarding, let's say, uh, incitement. Uh, and those standards can be very strict. But if ICANN does it, then it's not state action, it's contractual action, and uh, therefore you might not have the protection of the human rights protecting constitutional uh, provisions or uh, statutes. Now, there's another reason why uh, multi stakeholderism may not be always good for human rights, and that is that private actors may not have the same due process or procedural protections as a democratic, accountable government. Again, not all governments are democratic and accountable, but if they are, frequently they have the very specific uh, due process requirements. Now, of course, we've seen even in democratic governments like the U.S. that the due process requirements can be overcome. Um, but, uh, and, and they can sometimes be ignored, but at least then you have a court system that tells you, uh, you know, you can't do that, you can, you can appeal it, and they can get uh, their hands slapped or even put into jail for breaking the law. A private actor may not have that kind of due process. For example, ICANN has a very weak kind of judicial review, known only as the independent review process. And uh, it's very difficult to go through, and fundamentally, it's, it's not all that independent. But there's a third reason that uh, multi stakeholder organizations, or at least ICANN, can be bad for human rights, and that is that governments can mix with multi stakeholder institutions and kind of give you the worst of both worlds. So suppose that the, a government wants to suppress. Uh, some kind of speech or some or overcome some kind of privacy protection, but it can't do that in its own jurisdiction and it can't do that uh, according to its own laws, but maybe it can do that if it works by informally influencing a private corporation. So just look at the way the U.S. government has uh, basically manipulated ICANN to compromise privacy rights in, in, in the Hoonies in response to the demands of law enforcement. I understand that the U.S. has very important interests in the effectiveness of law enforcement, but basically the ICANN system and the Hughes system provides a way of circumventing certain privacy protection, uh, and even when ICANN was ready to provide those, I those privacy protections, the GACs kind of intervened and stopped ICANN from doing that, 
And again, that wouldn't have been possible if the government had been acting according to their own laws, uh, but it was possible because they were working for a private actor. Well, another example would be to look at the claims made over geographic names. However sympathetic you may be uh, about the claims of the Latin American countries that the word Amazon should not be a top level domain owned by a big corporation, there's really no basis in international law for that claim. There's absolutely no law that says that somebody can't register the name Amazon and use it for whatever they want to use it for. And yet, through the GAC and through ICANN, uh, governments were able to assert and win uh, this this right, which they really don't have any basis for in law. So those are my three cautions about multi-stakeholderism. Again, the good points are that you're out of the world of pure intergovernmentalism, and you do have a voice. But on the other hand, this relationship between state and private actors can be very problematic and can lead you in directly to rule all of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Milton. Um, our, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Simon Rice, uh, is, a, is a European uh, privacy expert. So we just heard a little bit about how um, ICANN has historically handled or not handled uh, privacy concerns. And uh, Dr. Rice, uh, with Article 29, um, can give us a little bit more in-depth in detail on uh, uh, the privacy protections that our European citizens, at least, are are owed, and the extent to which um, ICANN policies uh, can um, uh, further those privacy protections. Uh, Dr. Rice, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Let me know if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Thank oh, you. Good. Thank you. Um, yes, I think what I think is a right for privacy is linked to data protection itself. It's a long legal prediction, a uh, traditional European legislative framework, uh, got after late in the European Convention of Human Rights, provides that right to respect for one's private life and our private and family life of home and correspondence. And this right is further developed in the European Data Protection Directive, uh, giving the data subject specific protection for when their personal data is processed. Uh, including specificity and purpose, retention, and disclosure to third party. Now, whilst there might be differences within each of the 28 now member states uh, in their national legislation implementing the CE directive, they all do have that common root in that, in that legal framework. I think it's also worth recognizing other... Excuse me, Sally, can I interrupt you for a moment just to yes, ask you if you can uh, turn on your webcam, so if you, if you like? Uh, I can try. I might be a bit bandwidth impaired. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry to interrupt you. That might be a bit Please go ahead. <laughs> um, but this is worth recognising other international uh, legal frameworks. It's about the, the privacy framework of the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. And they promote a flexible approach to information privacy protection across, across the APEC uh, member economies. And the APEC privacy framework is also consistent with, with the core values of, of OECD's 1980 uh, guidelines on the protection of privacy and transport of flows of data, the principles of which ultimately gave rise to the new data protection directive. So the, you know, the aim of this little introduction I'm giving is to, to illustrate that the privacy and data protection are topics with an international interest, uh, and the importance of which is, is recognized by a number of different national legislations. And the internet itself has obviously delivered a great number of benefits to society at large across the globe, uh, including opening up these trans-border data flows and enabled you know, a great number of services to operate across international borders, and who knows even perhaps beyond what was envisaged uh, to happen. And I think you know, to, to realize all this, this great potential, what government was possible, clearly have an important role in ensuring that their policies and agreements, which set out the fundamental procedures uh, in the operating of the internet, as we've just heard, I can, you know, must, must make sure they are fit for purpose primarily, but, but also appropriate for operating in that global perspective and that global marketplace. 
<coughs> of course it's really, you know, we know it's all unfortunate they're not used all users of the internet you know, do so in accordance with their own national or international laws so it's right that things like domains are uh, being controlled and as proper records are kept by registrars um, such as they, so that they can use be, be used in the correct circumstances and indeed you know, ourselves and, and other data protection authorities across the EU are aware of many of the difficulties in, in contact with the registrar you know, is operating a service which is, which is not processing personal data, perhaps in accordance with the law or, or the data subject wishes. But personal data retained for such proper records must be proportionate to its purpose and only used for that specified purpose. And furthermore, excessive data collection or, or excessive processing shouldn't conflict with, with another highly regarded European right, you know, and that's a freedom of speech. I'm sure we can, we can all think of many examples where you can find information that's been published online as a direct result of, of privacy or proxy prote protecting personal data of that domain registrant. Um, of course, where there's abuse in the current registration system, one immediately assume that collecting more or different data you know, should address those problems. Um, but in addition, any system offering any kind of tiered access for law enforcement must have a transparent system of oversight and audit. You know, to an extent to which those individuals who, who are submitting their personal data can be confident that it's only used for different purposes, uh, whatever jurisdiction it, it might be put it to. Of course, yeah, I think the internet naming system will you know, no doubt continue to grow and develop uh, in such a broad number of ways. You know, we've got recent developments you know, this week in what I can, um, the, the new generic top level domains and internationalized domain names. So I think this, in conjunction with an ever increasing number of individuals and organisations, uh, can only ever lead to a greater international aspect in the future. So I think just to close, I think it's, you know, in this regard, it's, it's assuring that ICANN have publicly stated their respect for applicable data protection laws, uh, both in the EU and, and around the world, and that the organisation is willing to consider arrangements uh, to revise procedures, perhaps on the conflict. Uh, with local data protection and privacy laws. But of course, you know, bear in mind the common legal framework of, of the EU member states, and there is an opportunity to provide a common policy and procedure applicable to, to more local jurisdictions on a basis. Um, and of course, the EU organisations which, which we're, uh, I can interact with. So I think that that's I'll finish there. Um, just whilst I've still got, uh, still got a good connection, I don't get uh, booted off anyway. Um, and I look forward to some questions from the discussion at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rice. Um, our next uh, panelist, um, also uh, on, on remote, is uh, Stephanie Perrin. And, and as we explained, she's been working on ICANN's uh, expert working group on directory services, um, also known as who is, and um, she can explain a little bit about how that experience has been in terms of trying to get um, legal privacy protections built into ICANN policy. Stephanie, are you there? I don't hear any anything yet. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. That's a famous word. You can hear me now. Okay. Uh, well, thank, thank you. you very much for that introduction. Um, uh, as mentioned, I have been working as a privacy expert on the uh, expert working group that is utilizing the services in the context of the new generic top level domains. It's been suggested to me that not everyone is. Uh, aware of some of the history with the who is and, and perhaps I should at least sketch that out. Um, there is a lot of inaccurate data in the current who is and there is a reliance on the part of those who are looking for privacy on proxy services. Uh, in other words, they that we have a wide open system basically and the only way to protect your privacy uh, in jurisdictions where there isn't legal data protection that's being enforced, it to use a proxy service provider and there that appears in the who is. So there is a general appetite for more, more accurate information in the who is uh, and, and more data. Um, 
So, um, what I'm about to say, I don't want to um, discuss the decision that's been going on within the EWG. I just want to give you my impressions as a relative outsider of the um, of ICANN, uh, but somebody who's been involved in trying to do data protection uh, the and technical protections for most of my career. So. My first observation is that although ICANN is an independent corporation established as a not-for-profit, uh, it's still, in the terms of the European Union's language, data controller. Um, by that, I mean that it sets the terms and conditions for the collection of your personal information, even if it does not, as a, a corporation itself, manage the information. So it sets these conditions through policy and through contracts, uh, such as the recent uh, registration accreditation agreement that was signed after two years of negotiation. Um, so, in my view, the data uh, provisions that are contained in that agreement um, definitely ought to be part of a more comprehensive privacy policy at ICANN. Uh, the reason for this is that all data collection and retention requirements have to be justifiable in terms of data protection law. Uh, so, to the extent that ICANN has not fully articulated all the purposes for which it collects, uses, and discloses personal information, um, it's not really measuring up to what's expected of a mature corporation. And we did get an excellent overview of the development of ICANN as, a, as an institution, as a multi-stakeholder institution. Uh, but it's been a short time. It has now uh, grown rapidly, and in my view, it's time to have a, uh, a comprehensive privacy policy that sets the rules around the world, recognizing that there are uh, possibly as many as 100 different data protection laws that we're uh, dealing with. So, uh, my recommendation is that I can develop binding corporate rules. Um, I have been also told that most people are unfamiliar with bonding corporate schools, but they are a, I don't like to use the word legal, but they are a contribution of the Article 29 Working Group, recognizing that global corporations might be subject to many different data protection laws and that from a management perspective, they need to harmonize within the company and set rules at a high standard that will enable their staff to manage personal data uh, wherever it is within the company. And also, it would streamline the, um, the transporter data flow from the European Union of uh, data to another part of the company that might be in a jurisdiction that lacked adequate data protection. And for those unfamiliar with the European Union and the debates over adequate data protection, I'm doing parentheses here in the air, um, basically data protection authorities in the uh, union are not uh, supposed to permit the, um, the passage of data outside the union to a jurisdiction that doesn't have basically similar uh, data protection law. So um, these binding corporate rules, uh, it would be a bit of a process for ICANN to develop them um, and first have to is state very clearly what purposes for gathering all the people data that might be, and that would include other kinds of data that we don't normally talk about at ICANN, such as staff HR data, such as the personal data of, uh, of volunteers who participate in the many multiple groups. Um, so it's, it's, it would be a comprehensive uh, process. Now, Beyond that, um, I, I would encourage you, make no mistake, uh, binding corporate rules are no substitute for data protection law, and registrars, for instance, will still have to adhere to the law in their territory, but it would certainly do, go a long way in harmonizing um, the statement of what the expectations for the protection of personal information are uh, within ICANN. So, um, uh, I think that's really all I need to say there. I'm happy to take questions uh, later. Um, the second uh, recommendation that I would have, and uh, we made this in the preliminary report that was issued on the uh, expert working group's recommendations for who is, um, 
the, uh, we discussed it on a high level, and I think perhaps people didn't understand really what we were proposing. Uh, there are certain groups who are very much at risk who would never go back like to register domain names, uh, but without fear of having an organization, possibly a government, show up at their door or the door of the proxy registrar and demand to know who they are. Uh, these groups include reporters operating in alien territory, um, uh, political dissidents or even unsuccessful candidates in elections in some countries um, that are forced into exile after their defeat at the polls. Uh, it would include ethnic groups subject to discrimination and religious groups subject to persecution. It could also include individuals such as victims of domestic abuse or those fleeing from religious thought who have been given a change of identity by their governments. Um, many, and many Western governments, at least, provide changes of identity to people who, when it can be established that they're in, in danger of their lives um, from being pursued by their harassers. So technology exists which could provide secure anonymous credentials for these individuals uh, who could then send these anonymous credentials to a proxy service provider and get a domain name without ever identifying themselves or how they came to the domain. Um, it's worth noting that financial information is kind of the go-to standard for tracking people down. So that, uh, a credit card will give away what, whatever you try to protect through other methods. So it would require quite a bit of infrastructure to be set up to enable it. But I think from the human rights perspective, it would uh, up a lot of the uh, high-profile cases. So first, ICANN would need some sort of tribunal to accept applications. This could most likely be done through proxies or associations such as Reporters for Reporters, International Ecumenical Organizations, or in the case of um, a name changes, uh, identity changes, uh, possibly the government that granted it. Then an organization that would accept anonymous payment or payment through proxy um, would have to uh, grant the credentials, and it, that would have to be accredited. And thirdly, um, Proxy registers need to be found to accept these cryptographically enabled credentials payment payments, and um, they would thus, of course, be ensured that um, no harasser could come and demand their um, servers uh, to to um, expose the identity of the residents. Now. Um, it's really difficult to ensure anonymity, but this would at least uh, look after ICANN's responsibilities in terms of guaranteeing um, that the individual's uh, personal information was protected. So uh, could ICANN, as a multi-stakeholder corporation, do this? Uh, yes, I believe it could. It might have to set up some of these processes itself. Uh, because this may not fit the market model. But I think if you're sincerely interested in protecting human rights, um, this is something that uh, needs to be accommodated. Um, so now the, the last uh, sort of point that I would like to make, and, and we'll see it in the next version of the EWG's um, proposed recommendations for um, CAN, um, we have left with this rather thorny problem that um, I think Milton alluded to in, in his talk, um, and, and that is there has been pressure on ICANN to get more reliable data for the purposes of law enforcement. Um, there was certainly a provision in the uh, RAA agreement that we just saw in where the real purpose was to get data for law enforcement uh, in case they needed to do an investigation after the fact. Now, this is a well-known tension for data commissioners who have jurisdiction over law enforcement activity, and it's worth noting here that not all data commissioners do have uh, jurisdiction over the law enforcement um, authorities. Uh, it depends on what their in and what your constitutional provisions are, uh, which makes it complicated to try to come up with an international um, approach. Um, but most legal regimes have set up processes whereby the police go to the private sector to get personal information. And um, whether it's uh, the require a warrant or a subpoena or whatever, um, this due process um, is, is necessary um, in order to protect the individuals. And again, I refer back to what Nelson was saying about this 
So there's a worrying trend in uh, that data protection commissioners are expressing concern about now, and that is the tendency to ask the private sector to collect data that um, and and to mine it and process it. Uh, that basically. Um, law enforcement would have difficulties getting itself. ICANN doesn't want, I think, or should not want to be the, the, in that situation. So it has a responsibility to document what the transparency rules are and what the process is for, um, uh, for gathering data. And I think uh, that sort of brings us back to the binding corporate rules. Uh, in your binding corporate rules, state how, you know, what the services for law enforcement are, how to accredit law enforcement agencies to come in and get it, what the, uh, what the threshold is for explaining what they're doing with data, and, and uh, then have uh, audit trails available. So that's, uh, that's just, I would say, a win-win to some of the discussion, at least my thinking, on, on how these problems ought to be um, addressed, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, <clears throat> our next speaker is uh, Sarah Falvey from Google, and uh, she can give us some information on the private sector's experience with the multi-stakeholder model and ICANN. Sarah. Thanks. I'm going to be relatively quick because I want to make sure if people have questions, we're able to sort of engage with the audience, and I know we're running short on time. Um, just to give a quick overview of kind of the perspective uh, I have, I do a lot of work on free expression and sort of government um, control of the Internet. So kind of like along with what Milton was talking about, uh, I'm going to have more of a free expression type of angle. Um, and just to set it up, though, because I don't think we really have, and I'm not a human rights expert, but when we talk about human rights, it's usually sort of two different types of human rights. The first type of human rights are absolute human rights, and these are generally sort of global norms that are accepted um, throughout the various regions. There are things like um, the right to life and, and things that are codified in UN treaties and, and things like that. And then the second type of human rights are things, uh, it's um, non-absolute human rights. And, and this is primarily where most of us exist. We, it's this sort of gray policy area where it's not universal. It, it changes depending on what region you're in, what country you're in, and sort of, you know, government perspectives. Um, and so from a free expression angle, uh, the, the non-absolute human rights can run the gamut. So on the one side, you have things like, child pornography, which is generally accepted to be illegal almost, I, I, I'm not sure if it's global, but it's very close to being global. And even in the United States where we have pretty broad um, definition of, uh, and lots of rights associated with freedom of expression, child pornography is something that's illegal um, and not considered a part of the free expression canon. And on the other side, you have, uh, you know, things like, uh, what Peter was talking about, domain names and, um, you know, people talking out about their government or anti-Semitism in Europe and things like this. And these are things that, depending on what region you're in, legally they're either allowed as free expression or they're not allowed as free expression because they go against the government. And so one of the things um, that's really important when you talk about sort of the multi-stakeholder model and the protection of rights, particularly free expression, is that the second that you sort of do a more government-focused perspective, the, what tends to happen is you sort of go to the lowest denominator. So instead of seeing filtering in regions, things like anti-Semitism, which is filtered in Germany and other parts of Europe, or um, concerns about uh, expression against the government, which some Arab countries have laws against, uh, when you have a government approach to human rights and free expression, you tend to sort of take the lowest common denominator. So um, all of these regions, you get together, you sort of, to provide a global framework, you would basically go around and say, well, this is 
not allowed in my region, this is not allowed in my region, et cetera, and you sort of create a list, and what would happen is that instead of having filtering on sort of the national level, you'd have filtering on the international level. And so one of the great things about the multi-stakeholder model from a free expression angle is that it allows for people to come together, to work together, to have multiple perspectives on what should and should not be allowed online, and to have everybody sort of voice their opinion, whether it's civil society, business, activists, governments, and work together to come up with a framework that, that pr tries to work for everyone. And as Milton pointed out, it's, it's not perfect, but the, the great part about working through the multi-stakeholder model is that by having all those, those voices, the chances that you sort of have a repressive um, government-focused framework that becomes predominant is, is greatly weakened. Um, and that's sort of, you know, the, the main part of what I wanted to talk about. The other interesting thing about multi the multi-stakeholder model is that when you're talking about freedom of expression and thinking about rights, a lot of it is balancing sort of different cultural norms and sort of social norms that exist in your area. And the balance, the transparency around that balance is what's really important. So going to back to what Milton said, because he and I are sort of, I think, having a similar perspective, when you, when you aren't transparent about what you're doing, when you allow governments to sort of interact with ICANN in a way that's against uh, sort of the operating model, which, which Peter talked about, and that non-transparency, that's where you really run into, into problems, and I think where the multi-stakeholder model breaks down. The real benefit of the multi-stakeholder model in terms of protecting human, human rights, specifically around free expression, is that concept of transparency. So everybody sort of knows what the perspectives are. We come together. We try to work it out. We try to develop a global framework that we can sort of all live with or all work together on. Um, that's, you can go to the next one. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Sarah. Um, our, our next speaker, uh, Nick, Nicholas uh, Seidler, with um, the Internet Society, can uh, give us a bit of a broader perspective on how um, other uh, multi-stakeholder institutions deal with human rights issues. Um, Nicholas, please. Thanks, and good morning. Um, yeah, so first of all, a, a disclaimer, I'm, I'm not an ICANN expert, so... Um, well, my, my presentation is going to focus on um, the nexus between human rights and another member of the technical community, uh, which is the Internet uh, Technical Standards Community, the, I, the IETF. And um, especially I will take the, the example of the positioning that the IETF has taken regarding surveillance, which, you know, it, it's been quite... Um, an uncommon uh, thing for the ITF to, to stand up and, and really address issues which are related so, so clearly to human rights. So um, first of all, uh, very briefly, um, back to the basics of uh, the relationship between the Internet architecture and, and human rights, I think it's quite fair to say that um, the design of the network has been quite consistent with human rights, in particular with freedom of expression. Um, it's a global decentralized network. It empowers endless innovation at the edges of the network. It basically enables anyone to talk to anybody, uh, uh, anybody else uh, uh, from anywhere. I, I like to make the analogy that um, the Internet is based on open standards like the TCPIP protocol, which allow different networks to talk to each other. The, the, they are, in a way, the, the, the standards are the language of the Internet. And by extension, they also allow people uh, from across the globe to, to talk to each other as well. So the, the code, the architecture from the sort of pure version of it uh, has been quite consistent with, with human rights. So, well, 20 years ago, we might have been able to, to stay with that idyllic picture, but we know that technology often has two sides, and there is a, a dark side to, to the force, so to say. So e erosion of privacy, new tools for censorship, content filtering, mass surveillance, um, these are all um, 
sort of ways that the network has been used in a way which uh, gets further away from the ideal of Internet pioneers, which is to have a network that facilitates communications and not a network which is a sort of Orwellian tool for, for espionage. So, um, well, th that takes me to, to um, the role and the reaction of the technical standards community in the face of uh, pervasive uh, surveillance. And, um, well, it's been an area of, of great concern uh, for this community, for the engineers working on, on those core technical standards. Uh, security is definitely not a new concern uh, for the ITF, but uh, these events have, I think, really generated a new motivation to, to address uh, long-standing uh, security challenges that are currently working on things like HTTP2, the, the transport layer system, several protocols, and a, a trying to improve the, the, the underlying security of, of these protocols. Um, I was actually listening quite carefully to um, uh, the opening address by uh, Yari Arko, the, the chair of, of the IETF at, at this Internet Governance Forum. Um, and I think he, he expressed some very interesting and actually quite strong statements, uh, strong visions about uh, the Internet from a technical perspective as related to surveillance. So, for example, he said that uh, we should move from an Internet which is insecure by default uh, to an Internet which is secure by default. Um, he emphasized the fact that, well, nowadays people, uh, well, usually you, you, you you have a secure connection for banking uh, transactions, but there is not a widespread use of, of uh, uh, secure connections for users. Um, he also said that w we should make surveillance more costly, uh, not necessarily uh, only in terms of financial cost, but also in terms of the cost of being caught surveilling and being uh, embarrassed. So. Um, these are some of the, the ways forward that have been indicated, but of course uh, there are limits to what technology can fix. Um, first of all, it cannot change the, change the political context. Uh, if you have, for example, a country which uh, forbids the use of encryption uh, and makes encryption illegal, uh, uh, there is not much that technology alone can do. Um, Core standards cannot change also uh, much at the implementation level. Uh, when there are commercial software based on standards, uh, they, they, they may not be as secure as, as the, the underlying standards. And finally, it cannot help if actually users uh, do not communicate with trusted peers and if users actually don't secure their own communications. So basically, there is no, uh, I, I guess, silver bullet uh, solutions, but again, the, the position of the ITF as one stakeholder in this broader debate has been to say, okay, we are going to try to you know, develop uh, a diversity of technologies can, that could possibly uh, address the diversity of uh, attack vectors. Uh, to conclude, um, back to, 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 to the, the presentation by, by Milton, uh, indeed, the, the, ITF, the ITF does not have uh, constituencies. It, it works differently. It's basically open to, to anybody to participate. It's organized by uh, working groups dealing with uh, specific issues. Uh, there are working groups on privacy, security, and um, well, the, the, there have been, you know, civil society people attending the ITF, uh, sharing concerns. Uh, policymakers as well. I think we need more. Um, and yeah, I think that that's one of my, my takeaways, uh, the, the message I wanted to, to come across. I think that it's very important that different stakeholder groups mingle in each other's processes. So um, again, we need to have more non-techies go to the ITF meetings. Uh, the ITF is here coming to the IGF, which is a non-technical uh, uh, forum. Actually, they, they have their open forum right now. Um, so, so for me, that's uh, that's one of the takeaways in standard, in terms of of multi-stakeholder cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Um, I wanted to uh, get some more discussion going amongst the panelists and and with the uh, the audience and the remote uh, participants as well. So let me just uh, let's start this 
portion by asking if our uh, uh, panelists want to make any any comments on each other's uh, remarks. Peter. <laughs> What a surprise. Um, Milton, I was interested in your um, list of problems. I want to take issue with the suggestion that the governments have a veto uh, at ICANN. Uh, I, I know you sometimes use that as sort of shorthand for the process, but just to remind everybody that the process is the GAC gives advice and it's up to the board whether or not to accept that advice. Uh, and the advice is not always accepted. And we had a session yesterday which highlighted two areas where, where it was not. Um, in addition, of course, to the rejection flat out in relation to the triple X top level domain for adult content, the GAC originally gave quite extensive uh, advice on what it regarded as appropriate geographic restraints in the new GTLE program, and the and the board pushed back on that and came up with a very different solution. There and there are a couple of others. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, Milton, I just wonder if you, I think you're right, however, in relation to the fear about the lack of due process because of the fact that you're dealing with uh, private actors dealing by contract. Um, do you have uh, any ideas about a solution to that problem? Milton. Milton, are you there? We can't. Okay, now we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm really have sound now. I believe so. Go ahead. Thanks. Okay. Um. So. Um, yeah, that's that's very nice. He wants me to solve the problem if I can. Um. I think there is a solution. I think the the solution is to uh, eliminate the gap. One thing that's obvious. It's very clear that that's a structural flaw. And uh, when I've been talking to the regional internet registries, by the way, I was just uh, re-elected to a three-year term as on the advisory council of Aaron, and, and they have to interact with governments also. And uh, every once in a while, somebody uh, proposes maybe they should have something like a GAC. And in fact, there may be some non-transparent interactions going on uh, with governments in some of the RIRs um, to be worried about, but fundamentally, they have listened, I think, to my argument and to their own experience and said that the idea of putting the governments in a room by themselves and allowing them to make a parallel policy process uh, after the bottom-up process has given, you know, has done its work and then we have a completely different policy process that the governments uh, have done all by themselves and then we have some kind of power struggle at the end of the game. So this is just a bad idea, it's just a bad way to do things. Um, so, one solution is to not segregate government in the way that I can segregate them. Uh, everybody tells me that this is not a feasible idea and then nobody will ever accept it, but if you say you're abolishing the GAC, you're, you're telling governments to go away, it's actually not true, you're just telling governments to participate in the same process that everybody else participates in and to be actually, you know, equal status stakeholders and not special stakeholders. Another solution to that problem is, in fact, to have more uh, of a, a binding constitution and binding accountability on the ICANN board and to have more of a real bottom-up process. I think I noticed that you did not take issue with my pretty outrageously controversial statement that ICANN doesn't have a true bottom-up process, that the board can kind of override things and that we're just really advising them uh, even more weakly than the GAC, because according to the bylaws, you know, the, the board has to kind of listen to the GAC. But uh, the other part of the bottom-up process really just passes these policy proposals up, which just kind of get, um, you know, handled by the board. Sometimes they agree, sometimes they don't, sometimes they mangle them beyond recognition. Uh, so if we had a process more like the RIR, in which all the board does is ratify a policy, it doesn't rewrite it, it doesn't uh, decide to make bargains with government or 20 other people at the last minute, it just ratifies or doesn't ratify a policy, I think that would be a big part of the solution also. Thank you. We're, did we have any other uh, remarks from our, our panelists?
Okay, well then let's um, take this opportunity to get some discussion and questions and comments from the audience. Um, and I also think we should point out that we have ICANN's ombudsman with us here today, Chris Lahat. So if you'd like, maybe you would like to say a few words about, about the treatment. Thank you, Robin. I'm glad you read my tweets. Uh, my name's Chris Lahat. I'm the ICANN ombudsman. And it's curious that the first couple of speakers uh, didn't make any mention at all of the role of the ombudsman in the context of human rights and within the ICANN organization. And frankly, I'm a little bit disappointed, uh, partly personally, because it means that I'm not uh, adequately uh, spreading the message about my role, but also because uh, it leaves out, I think, a very important part of the multi-stakeholder model. It's all very well having this complex structure, but if something is going wrong within the structure, people aren't getting on, there are disputes, there are issues, uh, then there is a structure in ICANN, which has been in place since, I think, 2004, when the office was set up, uh, of complaining about issues of unfairness to the ombudsman. And unfairness covers a pretty wide range of things. Uh, and it is, among other uh, items, meant to uh, provide an outlet for issues such as uh, racism, uh, sexism, uh, challenges to diversity uh, of all sorts, uh, failure to listen to people, uh, which is very important in uh, a multi-stakeholder context, uh, and uh, issues within ICANN itself. Now, it might be, and it's uh, been said in the past, that the office uh, of the Ombudsman is a little bit toothless, but this year the board has specifically accepted some of my recommendations in the context of uh, some of the uh, dispute resolution panel decisions. And so the board does listen. Uh, and I reach out to members of the community in a wider sense, not just the ICANN community, but to consider the model of having someone within these organisations, and not just ICANN, but also the others, uh, who has a similar role to the ICANN Ombudsman. If you are concerned about these issues not being heard, uh, issues of diversity, uh, issues of inability to get your message across, then uh, an ombudsman has that particular ability to get through uh, effectively a lot of the red tape. It's worth noting that I have access, uh, if I wish, to any document at all within ICANN. The bylaw is very specific and quite clear. So in the course of an investigation, I can look at everything. There are always going to be documents which are not going to be disclosed for all sorts of good reasons, but I can still look at them uh, and I can still form an opinion uh, and recommend to the board something based on those documents. So in terms of privacy issues, uh, I have in reality some input on those issues as well. I can look at a document and say, well, is this something that should have been disclosed? Uh, and make a recommendation accordingly. Uh, and from time to time I get asked that very question, why aren't these documents being disclosed? And when I go through and look at them, sometimes I'll say yes, they should be, and sometimes I'll say no. So to sum up, uh, this is the first IGF I've been to, uh, and I'm disappointed that no mention uh, has been made at all uh, of the particular role and function of the ombudsman uh, within multi-stakeholder organisations. Uh, and I hope that in future people will think, well, perhaps we need a model like this uh, and perhaps come and see me uh, specifically uh, if they have one of these issues which relate to human rights issues or privacy issues. A and as a footnote, uh, there are some interesting recommendations in ATRT2, the draft report, which is on the ICANN website, in relation to issues such as 
uh, whistleblowing and access to documents uh, and suggesting perhaps there's a role for the Ombudsman uh, in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, did anyone want to comment on, on his thoughts? Uh, I, I just wanted to thank Chris for that contribution and ask, uh, in general terms, would you be able to report, portion the amount of work that you're doing between sort of what we could think of as human rights issues as opposed to administrative you know, breach of contract, not being permitted to vote, uh, you know, uh, other, uh, if, if you could take Sarah's sort of distinction about the rights. Uh, is that a helpful question? It's a good question. Thank you, Peter. Uh, the number is quite small. Uh, there are a regular number of such complaints, but they're not large in number. Probably, just thinking through over, say, the last year, I would have had around about 10 or so in that category. Just by way of explanation, I didn't discuss any of the remedies, perhaps while we're talking about it, that mentioned the others. Uh, we've got the independent review mechanism, uh, we've got a reconsideration of board decision. And the other thing we, we do in any of the, we, we have published rules of conduct, so when we're having a session at ICANN where there's public debate, uh, the person running the session usually starts off by reminding people of those rules of conduct, of courtesy, respect, not talking over each other and those sorts of things. So. Um, there's a reasonably constant attention, I think, to that. Whether it works or not, I suppose, is another question. Were there uh, any other questions? From yes, please, Lee. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Lee Hibbard. I'm from the Council of Europe uh, in Strasbourg. Um, I'm, from what I've heard, I'm. I'm uh, it's, it's quite clear that there are public policy uh, considerations by ICANN, which are a lot about the human rights that have been mentioned. And a long time ago, uh, I was, it was told to me that ICANN was about assigning names and numbers, about technical issues. But obviously, pu pu public policy is also there now. So there has been, there has been developments there. And the Council of Europe has been looking at the ICANN for, has been involved in ICANN for a few years now. Uh, it became an observer to the, the GAC, uh, I think it was in 2010. But even before then, we were, we were, you know, we, we, we had issued documents regarding um, critical internet resources. Um, we even sent a letter um, to, to the CEO at the time about the importance of considering an international human rights advisory body, organ, within ICANN. Uh, to try to address the issues of, of the, the things that you've mentioned and other things. And so since then, um, the Council of Europe's member states, there are 47 member states in the European context, um, have uh, adopted a couple of recommendations, the declarations which look at, you know, saying that IP addresses, are, you know, are, they're a public shared uh, resource and, you know, there may be uh, personal data issues there where there, where there are personally identifiable issues regarding IP addresses. And then in 2011, there was a, uh, a declaration which talked about domain names and name strings, which says that there are links to freedom of expression, and these have to be considered, taken into account. So if you like, it's trying to, uh, uh, the, the work is trying to look ahead at what might come in the future. And when you think about uh, general top-level domain names and those issues, uh, you know, we're going towards those things. Who is uh, RAA and these sorts of things, they're all going towards things like uh, privacy issues. So there is, it seems there is a need um, to, to address these issues within an ICANN context because, um, and that's where we are, so the, the Council is very supportive of ICANN and, and as an observer of the GAC, it's, it's, it's helping, trying to help GAC to engage some comments on freedom of expression recently regarding new GTLDs. So we, we're very much in the, in the process of trying to give assistance to both GAC and to ICANN, so that's where we stand. And the reason for that is that um, uh, in a European context, the member states have signed and ratified uh, the European Convention on Human Rights. So it's a legally, it's a hard legally binding law in Europe, and there are rights to freedom of expression, the rights to privacy, the right to assembly and association. Uh, and if we look look ahead, what we do is we look ahead. We try to avoid, um, we try to shape the things to come and, and, and help member states understand what would be their uh, rights, you know, responsibilities regarding uh, protecting human rights in the future. And these are future issues, perhaps. Um, so being ahead of the curve, if you, if you like, and, um, and states under the convention have positive and neg negative obligations. 
they, they, they are required to do things and not and to refrain from doing things. So um, in, in many of the, the issues that you've mentioned, um, states, uh, you know, they have to abide by the convention. If that goes wrong, then an individual can petition the, eventually after exhaustion of domestic remedies in the country, it can petition the European Court of Human Rights and that they, can, uh, they can request that they say have a violation of, of a particular right in question. So, and then the government would, could be found uh, in violation of that right with regard to something in ICANN. So, uh, we'll, in looking ahead, uh, there's a need for governments to be aware of these issues and to make sure that they, they do their best efforts to protect those rights and freedoms in a global context, in a context with regard to ICANN, whether the, including that, that there is a GAC function in the ICANN. So, uh, and one way forward some years ago was to think about an international human rights advisory committee within ICANN to try to at least look internationally with different independent experts, look at those issues and try to give, uh, you know, expert advice, uh, balanced, neutral expert advice to, you know, to, to, to ICANN to make sure that it does its best efforts, it does, does its job properly. So that, that's where we're very supportive. We want to try to understand that. And I think some of the things that you mentioned today are, uh, are very important, very constructive, and we need to work together more in the future on these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. I think that's a really good suggestion. The International Human Rights Commission um, could oversee perhaps some of some of these issues. Um, I believe we have a question from our remote participants. A, a, a comments from uh, Stephanie Perrin. Stephanie. Stephanie, are you there? Can't quite hear you yet. Are you there? Just start talking and I'll let you know and we can hear you. Okay. Uh, there we go. Now I can hear you. Go ahead. Thanks. Very good. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on Nicholson's um, comment about, uh, if I'm summing this up correctly, about presentation. Um, and, and it has to do with uh, Chris's uh, discussion of intervening uh, as the ombudsman. Um, I was shocked, actually, when I got to know I can a little bit to see that there wasn't, despite the fact that it's multi-stakeholders, there's no kind of matrix representation such as you get in a standards body where you have to have so many of this kind and so many of another kind. It's basically uh, you volunteer. And so if I'm a small business person and I get bullied in a in a meeting or on a group, I can go to Chris and complain that I'm being bullied, uh, but it doesn't help me if I'm the only small business person and I really need reinforcements. I wonder if someone would like to comment on that problem, because it seems to me there are communities that need domain names that are not well represented here. Thank you, Stephanie. Did anyone mm -hmm. want to comment on that? Stephanie, Peter, being it, I'm not quite sure I understood the question, but it's, it's I, I understand just the audio quality. I think it's um, relating to the adequacy of representation, um, and the answer is that is always a problem, and one of the key elements in the multi-stakeholder model that, that, that's always makes it vulnerable is, is representation. Who are you when you stand up and say, are you speaking for yourself, are you speaking for a group, and who's the group? Um, so your issue of a single user needing support is part of it. I think that's though the by the democratic side of the process works, and the it's egalitarian. But you have to be able to carry your day. And if you've got an issue and you can't persuade a reasonable bunch of the group that you that to go with you, then you suffer the consequences. I, I don't see that really as a human right. I see that as a sort of a, a political reality. Does that? Does that actually deal with the question, or do we, do we not get that? It deals with the question, um, but I think as Milton pointed out, it, it, it means that as a multi-stakeholder organization, ICANN is not necessarily successful. I would suggest to you that in the time the Internet's been around, not everybody realizes the importance of the decision making that's going on at ICANN and it tends to be a congregation of the willing. Uh, the folks who are unaware, um, uh, there's a lot of decision making that goes without them. 
Stephanie Peter here again. I think you're absolutely right, and I highlighted the fact that that's addressed explicitly in the affirmation of commitments, that, uh, that there's this risk of the insiders who know. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, yes, uh, part of the exercise in this has to be you know, constant outreach to make sure people who are affected by the outcome of these decisions are invited to take part in the making of them. Thank you. I believe we have a question here and then there. Hi, thanks. Patrick Jones from ICANN, and I just wanted to bridge from the comments of the Council of Europe to um, highlight an issue that wasn't raised by the panel, and that's the, um, the ability of the, the allocation of um, domain names to um, enable the uh, consideration of cultural and historical preservation, um, how um, that's an aspect of human rights that um, we've seen examples with the um, delegation of uh, .cat and examples of internationalized domain names that are being used. Um, so this is a way that within the ICANN context, um, it might be overlooked, but it's uh, enabling people to seek, receive, impart information and ideas through unique identifiers in the domain name system. And that's tied very, um, spelled out very closely to the language that's in um, Article 19 of the Human Rights Declaration. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. My name is Luis. I'm from Indonesia. I'd like to comment uh, to Professor Milton Muller uh, saying that uh, eliminating uh, the gag fun function in ICANN, because we should not forget that ICANN is an ag agency under the NTA of uh, the National Telecommunication and Information Administration of the United States, which is government uh, organization. So, hang on a minute. No, no it's not an agency of the NTA. That's, that was the purpose of my introduction to say that it's a private corporation put together by, by the internet community itself. Well, they are still under uh, contract by the government of the United States. They, they have two contracts with the government, but they have contracts with lots of people about lots of things. It doesn't make them an agency of the United States government. Well, but still, I mean, I still we cannot dismiss the, how the authority of the government of the United States under the ICANN itself. So for me, I'm from uh, government, but then uh, still, even uh, among the government, uh, still we uh, have to fight whose government has the most interest over the internet, over the, the IP address. But then, uh, this is not my, my, my main point. My main point is, uh, I'm wondering if Professor Milton Moore have ever seen about uh, the ability of civil society or private company in the very the last developing countries, which is we have a lack of smart people, smart people who are not uh, within uh, the government institution. So, uh, meanwhile, these people uh, need the legitimacy, need the uh, protection under the law which is the government have the main uh, function to, to defend the right of the internet access. So, I mean, I can't, I can't not agree that in my understanding, multi-stakeholder, this is about the balance function from uh, diverse stakeholders to have the same footing in making a policy in making internet policy. So I don't think, see, I don't think that multi-stakeholder is about anti-government and then uh, either, either you choose the government or you choose the private or you choose, you choose non-private organization. Thank you. Th thank you. I believe uh, Dr. Mueller wanted to respond to your comment. Milton, go ahead. Okay. I, uh, I don't see the video. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a very important point. Uh, I think the first point to make is that really um, governmental representation and multi-stakeholder representation fundamentally mutually exclusive um, forms of governance. Um, that governments are, are supposed to aggregate the preferences of their society into kind of a single point and then in a traditional international organization a, a national government will basically 
pretend that there is one point of view for the entire state and it will represent that point of view in the intergovernmental forum. Uh, and that's, you know, sort of the classic 19th century, 20th century uh, sovereign nation state model of doing global governance. But the idea of having nation states represented within multi stakeholder organizations as a single point doesn't make a lot of sense because there are diverse interests that are not bounded by national territory. And there are actually lots of diverse interests within a given state, within a single government. For example, the the privacy uh, data protection authority in, a, in the French government might actually have a very different point of view from the law enforcement authorities, and the, uh, the IT administrators of the government might have a different view still. So if you truly believe in multi-stakeholder representation, you shouldn't pretend like it's one point of view for the entire government. You should have anybody from the government with an interest. Uh, participating in the process and on equal terms with everybody else. So when I call for abolishing the GAC, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, people who happen to be in government should not be allowed into the process. What I'm saying is that you either go multi-stakeholder or you go intergovernmental. You don't try to mix the two in, in a really, you know, bastardized form. You, you choose one or the other, and if we're going multi-stakeholder, then uh, yes, people from, from the Indonesian government can participate if they are the most well-informed people. You send them to the meetings, and, and, uh, and they participate in the bottom-up process just like everybody else. It may be that there's other people in civil society who can also speak for uh, what people in Indonesia want, uh, and it's not necessarily a monopoly of the government to speak out for what are the, the people of Indonesia actually want. Thank you, Mueller. Did you want to respond to that, ma'am? No. Okay. Okay. Were there any? Uh, we're just about running out of time here, a minute or two over. So, were there any final words from our from our panelists? Yeah, a very short remark. Um, I think that if we mean to have true multi-stakeholder participation on, on an equal footing, it strikes me that it's also very important to invest in building capacity, and that goes to the remark by the, the person in the audience. Uh, for example, I said, please talk to techies and go to the ITF, but of course you cannot throw people into a very technical space uh, and they, you know, uh, they need to have the tools. That ju just to give uh, an example, um, at ISOC we've started a fellowship for policymakers uh, to go to the IETF, and actually it's, it's a sort of program where we really try to uh, um, again build, you know, an understanding and explain, you know, what are the processes, how can you get around. So I, I guess you know that that's the same for any other fora, technical or non-technical. It's important to make that extra step. To, to make sure that uh, there is a meaningful participation by, by different stakeholders. Perhaps Robin, if I can just add to that, at the back of the room is Keith Davidson from Internet New Zealand. Internet New Zealand has an outreach and fellowship program. They've brought a number of people here from the, from the Pacific. And there's also an ICANN fellowship program that brings about 20 people from the region to each of the ICANN meetings. If you're interested in, in, in doing some of that outreach or going to any of these meetings, uh, or, or, or know of others who may be interested, you may want to follow up with some of those people about those fellowship programs. There's funding available to, to help increase the knowledge base. Thank you all. Um, we're out of time now, so I would like to bring this uh, session to a conclusion. Thank you very much to all of our speakers, uh, especially our, our remote speakers who are struggling in the middle of the night and, and, and with technology, and so I really appreciate all of your inputs and, and contributions to this, as well as the audience members. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, with that, we will bring this to a close. Thank you.